be here tonight with me. Feel the Spirit of the Lord. God, I praise you for sitting on the hill. I praise you for the people of all age groups, people that we've just met, people that we've known a lifetime. I praise you that we're not just the gathering of people, but we are your family. The ecclesia that called out the body of Christ. That we are bone of bone, flesh of flesh, merged together by spirit. God, I thank you that in this place tonight you speak to us as family. You speak with the voice of an authoritative yet loving Father. That your words have the ability to penetrate deep into our lives and touch every portion, every area, and every avenue. God, I thank you that your word is not bridled, that your spirit is not hindered, but that tonight you desire to speak to the deep things of your people. We declare that supernatural things are going to happen even now. That you're preparing a people even now to expand their idea, their knowledge, their intellect of who you are. God, I praise you that by the time this service is over, you will be seen as a great big God. And their problems will be seen as we little. And for this we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. Anytime I have to take some time off, y'all know I come back like a firecracker. And I, I got a little something, something fresh off the press. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Psalms 23? Psalms 23. It's so familiar, a portion of Scripture, you almost feel weird when you read it. And that's a sad thing because what I found out about the Word of God is you can read the same passage at different seasons in your life and speak to you on different levels. Have you ever had that happen? Uh, because the Word of God is not like the book Moby Dick. The Word of God is living. It's vibrant. And it doesn't just speak to your mind. It has the ability for the author, the Holy Ghost, to plant it into your spirit to speak to you at the exact location you are in. And I believe with everything in me, God is going to speak to people directly where you are tonight. In Psalms 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, somebody say surely. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Who wrote that song? Y'all better be known who wrote that song. I know y'all's pastor and he's preached that a lot. King David wrote that song. Now would you go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 13 and 14. That is one of the most used funeral texts. One of the most used hymns. One of the most noted Old Testament scriptures in the Bible. The same man that wrote that had this experience in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. God said to the prophet, I put away your sin, you're not going to die. But there were consequences. Everybody say consequences. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies. Somebody say enemies. enemies. Of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to thee shall surely die. Now I want to preach a message tonight that I'm going to title something I didn't read about. But I'll explain it at the end. I want to preach about the God of Jacob. Because what fascinates me about the God of the Bible is I understand why he said I'm the God of Abraham. Abraham was the man of faith. I understand why he said, I'm the God of Isaac, because he was the son of Abraham. And there was no glaring sins or indiscretions, really, in his life. But what fascinates me is he didn't say, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. He never identified with who he changed Jacob into. He was never ashamed to identify with Jacob where Jacob was. And what I love about my God is when everybody else is ashamed of you and wouldn't sit with you, He'll pull up in the empty chair. When other people don't want to say they know you, God will put His arm around you and say, not only am I the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, but I'm the God of O'Bear. Is there anybody that's glad when everybody else denies you that the God we serve won't deny you? The 
Bible says a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. One of the reasons God calls us to establish city on the hill is he wanted a strong understanding of the power of covenant, the power of being in union, the power of the people that you are in relationship with. The Bible said in Ephesians 5 verse 1, be ye therefore imitators, followers of God as dear children. Therefore I look at God and he becomes the pattern for how I'm to interact with people, for how I'm to engage people that God has called me to. What I found out about people, everybody say people, people. is people are like math projects. They will either add, subtract, multiply, or divide. Shall not. Many of y'all have met some people that have added some things to you. Am I right about it? Blessings like Randy and Laura and the rock ports I get to wear. Every time I wear them, I thank God for y'all. That was an addition. But how many of you have met some people that have subtracted some things from your life? It's like they were anointed to take your smile, turn it upside down, and try to make it a permanent frown. Kick your butt on the ground. You ever met that person? And some people come into your life and they always multiply the revelation, the love, the things God wants to do in your life. But other people, it's like they're sent into your life and there's always a spirit of division upon them. They're always trying to connive and to divide. What I have come to understand is when I leave this earth, I will be remembered for two things. I will either be remembered for the problems I solved for other people or the problems I created for other people. And I have determined that for the rest of my life, I want to be a problem solver and not a problem they can I get a witness I'm tired of kicking people down I'm tired of keeping them on like I want to help somebody get better I want to see somebody raise up I want to see I want to be a solution to a problem I want to be a vessel that God uses when I was naked you clothed me when I was hungry you fed me when I was in prison you came and visited me God put you on the planet to solve problems but when you get detached from the God that put you here to solve a problem you actually become a problem how many of you met that person how many of you are sitting beside them right now don't you raise no hands but we've all met people that when they're disconnected and devoid from God, they seem like they, they, they cause more uh, chaos than they create blessing and comfort of God. What I love about God is God won't just identify with you on the high point. Can I preach it? My God loves you enough to identify with you on the low point. I think about Penn State and I think about Joe Paterno and the great uh, monument they built to Joe Paterno when he was winning all them games when Joe Paul was there on the sidelines with a broke leg, 85 years old and everybody at Penn State heralded him. They idolized him. They loved that man so much that they built a statue to his success. But at the moment of his failure, they can identify with him on the mountain. But they tore his statue down when the fall was seen. And what happened at Penn State was awful. We don't know the full ramifications. I know Joe Paul didn't have nothing to do with the perverted side of it, but it amazes me how people will celebrate you on the mountain, but they will forget about you. And am I talking to anybody that when you're on the mountain, they'll tear down a fence to get to you, but when you're broke, they won't even pick up your phone. That when people are liking you, they with you. I can't get no help in here nature of the beast of humanity we want to get with the God on the top but the God I serve identified with the people on the bottom the God I serve was so powerful so awesome that he said I won't just celebrate you on the mountains I will be the lily of your valley and what amazes me about King David is we will read Psalms 23 and bless people at funerals and at weddings and at services but yet we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12 that the same man that wrote Psalms 23, also committed adultery and murder. Um, can I preach it tonight? You know, I've met some preachers that done some shady things. But I don't reckon I know a joker yet that's had nobody killed. Not, not to my knowledge. Uh, and, and took their wife and killed them. And so now as we read the Bible, we got to understand something. Either it's a fable or it's for real. That the God that was with David in Psalms 23 was the God that did not neglect him at the low point of his life. That God is the God that wants to manifest through the people of the house. But what you find out about people is everybody loves the Psalm 23, David. But everybody wants to forget about the 2 Samuel 12, David. But I declare to somebody that the God of the one verse was the God of the other verse. And that no matter where you are on life's journey, the God that I serve is able to meet you right
reach out to him on the mountain, but we'll run from him in the valley because we've seen people do us that way when we get in the valley. I get in trouble. I get talked about. I get, I get people mad because I can't be your friend when you're up and then act like I never knew you when you were down. Because the God of this book does not permit me to do so. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The Bible said that this great King David, the one who slew giants, the one that killed the lion and the bear, the one that God used, the one that God protected in the cave, the man that was after God's own heart. There was this divinity that God had placed in him. God had placed his spirit upon him. But yet there was this humanity that David dealt with and at a crucial season in his life, this humanity almost overtook him. And the Bible said that the prophet Nathan came to him, began to prophesy to him, and he said, God has forgiven you of your sin. Here's something we got to teach this generation. The God I serve, he'll forgive you of anything. Right. But you can't get by with everything. Right. Can't get no help in here. God will forgive me for drinking and driving, which I ain't done in about 20 some years. But God will forgive me of that. But if I run over somebody, there's consequences to that action. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And here's what God said. He said, David, you're going to live. But the child you produced is going to die. And here's why he said the child is going to die. Here's what I'm trying to get to. The child is going to have to die because you gave occasion to your enemies to blaspheme my name. What God was saying is every time that little boy walks to the 7-Eleven with you, they're going to say, that's the one that was produced. That's the one that proved David what real. That's the one that proves that God of Israel, he ain't much. He said, you gave enemies. Everybody say enemies. You gave enemies the right to blaspheme my name. Here's my question. When did they become David's enemies? Not after he failed. They were always his enemies. It just took his failure to expose them. I'm preaching right now. Because some of you have people in your life that are with you when you're up and you think they like you. But the minute you hit rock bottom, you're going to find out who the friend and who the foe is. Let me tell you who's got your back. The one that says, boy, you may be down, but I'm still with you. You might be crying, but I got your back. What's been wrong with the church is we're the only army I know that buries their wounded. In that movie, Lone Survivor, it tells the story of our brave Navy SEALs going into Afghan territory. And there were three men that they could have killed and saved them all, but there was something in them that didn't want to kill them, and they actually ended up sacrificing their life. But in the body of Christ, that one hint of humanity, that one hint of weakness, we're the first ones to bury. We're the first ones to disregard. Even though we have a Bible that is full of blatant characters that have problems like you, like you, like you, like everybody but me. And we'll preach about Joseph. Somebody said, why did you name your son Jacob? Because my Bible said he was always the God of Jacob. And I wanted my boy to know that no matter where he was on his journey, his heavenly father was an amplified version of me. That he always had. So we find that David is losing a child, Pastor Bobby, because his enemies are blaspheming the Lord. People he didn't know was his enemy until he fell down. I want to preach by the power of the Spirit tonight because there are people on the side of my voice that you have been wounded in this last season of your life. I'm telling you, man, God's been talking to me. There's something about getting weak in the flesh. And when you get sick, and if you're, you're a Holy Ghost preacher, there's somebody when your flesh don't feel like doing everything, your ear gets real sensitive to what God is wanting to say. And many of you have had people at one season in your life that you put a lot of stock in their relationship. But the moment you bust, the moment you struggle, the moment you failed, you found out that person wasn't with you no more. And you thought you lost that person at that moment. God has sent me here to tell you, you never had that person, baby. God might have let that happen to let you know you were putting faith in the wrong people. So quit crying over the people that left you. And praise God for the people that still got your back. Because when the dust settles and the smoke clears, the ones that still ain't ashamed of you, that's your brother and that's your sister. 
in life, you'll have people that try to enter your life. Uh, God woke me up at 2.15. And as he was waking me up, I was finally sleeping good. I didn't have to get up and take a breather treatment. I'm so doped up on prednisone, I could eat the south end of the North Bell Mule. <laughs> And I was like, I'm sleeping, and I'm sleeping good tonight. And God starts messing with me. I was like, now God, we can finish this in the morning. I'll remember this. And God said, no, I want you to get up, and I want you to write this down. I want you to tell this to your people. There are people that will come into your life, and I wrote it down. I was, I was diligent to get up in the night and write it down. That there are five types of people that's going to enter your life through your life. And the one is the compromise. The enemy always has people in your life that will try to compromise, compromise, mess with the promise that God has over your life. you got to watch out for people that are sent into your life because just as surely as God will send somebody into your life to bless you, the enemy will send somebody in your life to curse you. And the compromiser is the one that tries to make your promise altered. They're the one that don't understand why you be going to church. They're the one that don't understand why you raise your hands to God. They're the ones that try to talk you out of the very thing that God told you to do. He's the guy that sat in front of me and dad at the bank and tried to make us think this could never happen. It was the voice that laughed at us when we were in the bank. It was the people that got on the internet and said it ain't never going to happen. I just come to say the devil is a liar. When God gives you a promise, there can be no compromise. I wish to God The second group you can call the critical or the complainer. Yeah. I used to waste a lot of my energy, a lot of my oil, as Bishop Fred was talking about, trying to impress people, trying to bless people, that no matter what I did, it wasn't ever going to be good enough. I used to wear suits on Sunday nights. Well, that's either too loose, too tight, too black, too white. Start dressing down. They said, now he's being sloppy. <laughs> Had one deacon tell me one time, quit wearing suits on Wednesday night. Nobody does that. Wore blue jeans a few weeks later. He said, why are you dressing so sloppy in the pulpit? <laughs> Shut up. God was showing me, boy, if you live your life trying to impress them, you can't bless nobody. <laughs> Somebody's going to get set free in the name of Jesus. You live up to God and not up to them. You ain't got to impress. You just got to be used by God. Spirit. You know, I've heard of constructive criticism, but I've never found it. <laughs> Y'all know I'm preaching, right? Let me give you some constructive criticism. When it starts off like that, you know the bombs are coming. <laughs> when somebody comes into your life with a critical spirit and they ain't got nothing good to say about you, anything about you, they are not sent from God to elevate you. They have been sent by the enemy to alienate you because something in this is what God put in you and it's making them come against you it's not flesh against flesh it's spirit against spirit and you have to be the one that decides who gets your ear and who don't get your ear because God ain't going to park an angel on your shoulder and close up your eardrums when the critics come and if you ever going to do something for God you're going to have critics David had some haters everybody say haters if you ain't got no haters you ain't really done nothing because anybody that God has ever used has been talked about, they've been lied on, they've been persecuted. So many people in my generation think when they sign up for ministry, they're signing up for the easy thing. Let me help you, honey. When God puts his hand on you, the haters are going to arise. But the God I serve said, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Could you give God some praise that he'll bless you in public when everybody's looking just to show how much he loves you? third group of people. That's the convenient people. That's people that associate with you when it's convenient for them. Have you ever been hooked up with somebody? I know God's just dropping bombs on me. Have you ever been hooked up with somebody that you thought they liked you? That you thought they were with you? But you found out it was not a reciprocal relationship. That when they could get something off of you, they were, they were good with you. But the minute it became inconvenient, the minute there became a strain, there was a man that would always talk to me and he would always be my friend. But one time I was at a funeral I had to go to and the people there didn't much like me. 
And this man that I was hugging when nobody was looking, with those three people that really didn't like me, was sitting there, he knew they didn't like me. He walked by me like he didn't know me. And I thought, that better be God calling. Just tell me. <laughs> I had to mess with somebody. I don't care. Y'all know I'm playing. But I walked by that guy. He walked by me and I realized he's only with me when things are going good. But the minute there's adversity, he don't even want to know my name. I just want to tell somebody, when somebody has a spirit on them, that spirit did not come from the Father. That spirit came from the enemy. The spirit of the Father says, I love you at all times, and I will always be with you. I've got your, I got a six foot five, 270 pound brother that no matter what was up against me, he's got my Join Moose Lodges, Masonic Lodges, uh, Hell's Angels, Biker Dance. Because they're wanting to know I can be affiliated with a group that's got my back. And the last place many people ever think about coming to is a church. Because we painted the wrong picture. We've told them that church people will throw you out quicker than anybody. That church people will disown you quicker than anybody. When Jesus said the only thing that's going to see the real revival is when they see a love in here that surpasses any superficial thing that they have seen out there. Let me prophesy what God is doing in Tazewell County. He is raising up a group of people that are able to handle your good, your bad, and your ugly. He is raising up a family of people that says I don't have to agree with you to love you. I don't have to say it's okay to be gay to put my arms around you. I'm not going to quit preaching the truth. Me love me. When I got my earring, I ain't got it no more. My daddy didn't agree with that earring. He never quit loving me, but he didn't agree with that earring. He called me some names that you can't say in church no more. If I were to get a tattoo, my mom would not agree with me, but she would still cook for me when I'm hungry. You ain't got to agree with somebody's thought. To love that person. We have let the lie of hell make us think that we got to let down our standard and let down our guard. Here's what we got to do. We got to tell people the truth in love because I think if they take the time to come through the door, they don't want to be lied to anyhow. They're saying, preacher, I messed up. Can you tell me how to get untangled? I might be in perversion. I might be in adultery. I might be hooked on drugs. But do you love me enough to tell me how to get out of it? I say there is a city. We're not here to be convenient. We're here to be covenant. Judas, his name means praise. It was a praise that betrayed. You can betray people and praise God. But you can't worship people and betray. You can't worship God and betray people. Because the Bible says that everything that have breath, praise the Lord. A deer and an antelope can praise God. But a worshiper is somebody that goes past praise and gets into the presence of God and declares to God who He is. And you can't tell God who He is without Him turning around and telling you who you are. And when He tells you who you are, you have the ability to love everybody else because you ain't intimidated by nobody. The problem with the modern day church is we've taught people how to praise, but we've never taught them how to worship. But it is in worship that you find out your assignment. It is in worship that you hear from God. It is in worship that He puts His mandate upon you. Are there any worshipers in the house? For they 
my generation and the generation coming up under me is the most medicated generation in American history. Why? They're insecure. They're nervous. They're irrational. Why? Because we have failed as a church to teach them the power of worship. Because there's something you can get in worship that you can't get in a counseling session. There's something you can get in worship that you can't get in appeal. There's something you can get in worship and it's called identity. You look through the scripture. When they begin to worship God, he began to reveal to them who they are. And I'm just preaching to somebody right now. It is in the intimate places of your worship that heaven is going to open up. And you're going to feel the spirit descend as a dove and say, this is my son and my daughter in whom I am well pleased. It comes in worship. Somebody give him praise in this house. Then there are those that are connected, but for a season. Here's where I see a lot of people miss God. God will connect you to somebody for a season because they're with you at that season. But there comes a time, Abraham and Lot's season had to part. And there comes a time that you and that person, God's taking you to a level that person don't want to go to or that person can't want to go to. But our flesh, we get comfortable with people that we've been connected to for a season. And when I like somebody, I like it forever. Y'all like that? Yeah. And then God starts doing separation. Starts pulling the thing apart. It ain't because he's wanting to be mean to you. It's because you're going somewhere that they can't go. Let me, let me preach it. How many of you have ever seen the, the shuttle, the space shuttle go up? They don't do that no more now, unfortunately. Do y'all remember the boosters that would take them up about two miles and then they would fall off? Uh-huh. Those boosters were important for the journey, but they weren't equipped to go the whole way. What I'm saying is there's some people that minister to you at one season in your life, and just because it don't hit you that way anymore, it doesn't mean they were unnecessary. It means they have served their purpose. Quit trying to hold on to a previous season when God is bringing you into a new season. Quit mourning over Saul when God is getting ready. Seen people get stuck in a season. God's still speaking, God's still moving, but they're stuck in a season that's long past gone. Stuck with people that didn't let them go any further. There were people that were cool with me when I was preaching to youth. They were all right with me when I was an evangelist. But the moment I became a pastor, they, they went with that. No, Y'all know what I'm saying? Because they were with me in one season, with me in another, but they couldn't see where I was going. And some of y'all have been surrounded by people that they embraced you in one season, but they can't handle the season God's taking you into. Do you remember when David's brothers called him when he was coming up to see Goliath and they said, should you be back taking care of daddy's sheep? What they were saying is, we know you in that season. And we refuse to believe there's a greater season for you. I'm preaching right now. Because some of the people speaking into your life, they knew you when you were on drugs. They knew you when you were jacked up. They knew you when you were messed up. And they were okay with that you. But they can't handle this tongue talking you. They can't handle this lay hands on somebody you. What I've come to tell you is it's time to learn who's in you for the right season. Then there's a fifth group of people. That's covenant people. That's people that God doesn't just bring into your life for a season. That's people that when you have nothing to offer them, they're still there. That's people that when you're at your lowest moment and they see the ugly, they still see the value that's hidden behind all your mess. Those people don't just come from everywhere. Jesus had the multitudes. He had the 70. He had the 12. He had the three. Then he had the one that laid his head on his breast. Jesus understood that not everybody deserves equal access into your life. In the tabernacle of the Old Covenant, there was outer court, there was inner court, and there was holy of holies. Am I right about it? There was a mass group of people on the outer court, a limited group of people on the inner court, but only a high priest could go into the holy of holies. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying we are the tabernacle. We are the temple of God. And you can be nice to everybody on the outer court. And there's a few people you can let on a little deeper, but you don't give your most private part to just anybody that comes along. Let me help you young girls with something. Just cause they tell you you're pretty. Don't you let them through the veil. Just because they buy you a dinner. Don't give them the right to go a place that covenant has not permitted them. We've got to teach this generation. There's an outer court. There's an inner. But you ain't getting my whole in unless we in covenant. Somebody praise it. I said somebody praise it. 
Loving everybody does not mean letting everybody drive you up the wall. You've got to learn out of court people. You've got to learn inner court people. And you've got to learn who you Peter, James, and John. You've got to learn who your John Blood is. And I told you about five people. But there's a sixth person in the world. Because there'll come a time in your life that no matter who's in covenant with you, there's some seasons that you'll have to be like David. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <coughs> Behold, thou art with me. He wasn't talking to John. He wasn't talking to Jesse. He wasn't talking to Abinadab and Bihu, Eleazar, Shammah, Uzzah. He was talking to God. Because David realized that when you walk with God, there'll be sometimes you've got to walk through some stuff. That even those closest to you can't pull you. Can I get a witness in here? As Charlie begins to play, I've got to talk to somebody. Because Jesus in his garden experience, he had called in Peter, Jamie, he didn't call it 70. He didn't call 12. He said, I need my three boys. I need the ones that see me tired of the well. I've seen the ones that see me struggle. I need them with me now. There are times in your life that you've got to know who your midwives are. You've got to know who can handle seeing what you're really going through and still be in there. And Jesus called them in. And he said, can you tarry with me in the hour of prayer? But in that hour of prayer, as his sweats became as great drops of blood, he looked over and even his covenant people had went as far physically with him as they could. They didn't fall asleep because they were lazy. They fell asleep because they were exhausted. And you will go through seasons in your life that will exhaust the very ones that love you the most. And it's at those times when you can't get no help nowhere else. You better learn how to look up and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And there in that garden of Gethsemane, when Peter couldn't help him, and James and John said, I'm waiting so far as I can go. It was the Father that descended upon him. And out of that garden experience, he rose up in the power of the Holy Ghost. He embraced the cross. my responsibility to mature you and let you realize that if you go on to walk with God to greater levels there'll be some things you got to tell him you can't tell nobody else that's why David said he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high he shall abide under the shadow of the almighty because of some things in life we dealt with some struggles you've had, some fears that come upon you that you ain't ready to tell nobody but God. Have you ever been there sitting on you? But I found out is God will put good people in your life. I've got friends here. I've got family here. i got people that's been with me since I started preaching. And they've carried me. Y'all have carried me through the toughest physical season I've ever had. I've always prided myself on being healthy, being tough. I have been at the mercy of of people that loved me and put up with me when I was coughing my head off sick, couldn't get up, couldn't answer the phone. I love y'all. But there's been an experience on this journey where I just looked up into heaven. When me and Carlene were in that hospital room and my pulse socks went down to 88, the doctor's eyes got big. Looked over Carlene because Carlene's always like, you got this, you got this, you're okay, you got this. I looked there and I was like, I ain't got this, do I? She began to cry. Mama cried. I couldn't cry because I was surrounded by women. On the inside, I was bawling like a baby. It was at that moment, something in me started turning for battle. Tough. And I said to God, God, I'd really like to preach Sunday night. And I'd really like to preach like I felt like preaching again. And it was in that moment in my garden experience that I felt something come on me that said, I'm going to get you through this thing. And what I found out about my God is when God blesses the head, it always goes to the body. And I believe my word for you tonight is you're coming out of this garden. You're coming out of this season. You're coming out of this experience. For everybody that let you down, God's got you. For everybody that gave up on you, God is still with you. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and He is the God of Jacob. Somebody put your hands together.
You've had people try to lock you into seasons of failure and never believe you can do better. You've had people lock you into seasons of shame, seasons of pain, seasons of mistakes. And they refuse to believe. You can even see it in their eyes, that, that sarcastic tone. When you start talking about what God wants to do and they look at you like, yeah, how long you will stay in church? God says, just hold on. He's going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Many of you have been wounded and stripped because there were people that were compromisers and tried to make you believe God had no promise for you. God had no plan for you. Others of you, you're afraid to step out into ministry because at a critical season of your life, somebody criticized you instead of pushed you forward. I had people like Jerry Joyce West, mom and dad, my mom and papa, but I couldn't preach a lick. Some of you think I still can't, but when I knew I couldn't preach a lick, they'd say, you did good tonight, honey. You did real good tonight, honey. What if they had come up to me and said, boy, you just thank God. You embarrassed me tonight. You messed that up tonight. It was at that vulnerable moment, Lord, that they could either make me or break me. And I stand here on the shoulders of people that even when they could have criticized me, they held me up and kept pushing me forward. And I want what people did for me to be done all over this building. I declare for every voice that has criticized you, God is going to send ten that confirm you and that you know that you are called, anointed, and appointed. I feel the Holy Ghost all over that right now. The spirit of criticism is one of the biggest hindrances to the anointing. And many of you, God has called you to the next level, but you have been connected to the critic. And their words keep amplifying in your mind. God wants me to tell you how to reverse that. You can begin to rehearse what God says about you. And when the best sermon you'll ever preach is the one you preach to yourself. My best sermon ain't never been preached here. It's been preached in my bedroom when nobody could hear but me and God. When I said, Mary, you get yourself up, you shake it on and you go on. There were things I preached to me that I couldn't ever let out of here. But you're going to have to learn how to preach yourself out of some stuff. I feel some people bound by the spirit of the critic. Bound by the spirit of the compromiser. Wounded by those that were convenient. And unwilling to let go of to those that they were formerly connected to. God is here to do divine disconnect. Y'all feel this with everything in me, y'all. I ain't playing up on emotion. I felt something shifted in the atmosphere. I, I know God didn't make me sick, but God did have Bishop Fred Brown here to initiate a thing. There's been a spirit of revival all through this house. And what God is doing is He's not reviving a preacher. He's not reviving a man or a woman. He's reviving a body of people that He has called into deep ministry. As deep call them to deep. If you have been held down, if you have been bound and held back, it's your time to step out of the seat. Step out of your seat right now, right now, right now, as the Spirit of God flows. Your servant will come forth. Your song will be sung. Your voice will be heard. Your purpose will be accomplished. Because nothing they have said is greater than what God has said. Nothing they have declared is greater than what God has declared. Nothing in your past is greater than God's purpose in your future. There's about 15 more people right now God's speaking to. He's calling you Abraham, but you got to step out. He's speaking to you Abraham, but you got to come forward. This is a divine night. This is not an ordinary altar call. This is not a tug on emotion. This is the deep spirit of God speaking to the deep place of your life. Saying it's time to come forward. It's time to become. It's time to walk. It's time to flow. Live over the ocean. Live over the saints. Pray the Holy Ghost. Pray the Holy Ghost. Come on. Put your hands together. You're seeing a break. You're seeing a break. Somebody give God praise right now. Let there be a flow. Come on. Come on. Heaven's, heaven's clapping. All the work is done. We got people getting saved. People getting connected. People getting delivered. People getting set free. Thank you.
Jesus. If you're not where you need to be with the Lord, you didn't just come here because somebody invited you. God's calling you to something greater. God's calling you to something more. If you're in here and you say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want to go to heaven. Would you lift your hand in the air where I can see it right now? There's somebody here that says, that's me. I'm not where I need to be, but I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. Would you lift that hand where I can see it? I'm getting ready to get out of the way, but I believe there's some people here that God is speaking to your heart. Some have already came, but if you're in your seat and you don't know Him, you ain't got to leave that way. Worship the Lord as they sing.